to talk a little bit about the Eurodex. And the overall goal of this is to get you a sense as to what some of these clinical trial networks are doing and what, and, and because we, we look at the studies that you're doing as building the foundation for the studies that these networks will be doing in the future. So, take it away, Chris. Sure, before I start, specifically about Neuronex. So there's three networks you'll hear about, uh, Neuronex, ShowedNet, and Siren. And one of the things that Will didn't mention that came up when we were pulling this together for the Neuronex renewal that we're the course in, is if you go back to the Bell iteration of this course, which even before this, we actually got the roster from that. And there are a lot of people who have come through the course who are active participants either as site PIs among the three networks or have led studies among the three networks. So you, know, you can always argue they would have been successful with or without the course, but we like to think that the course did make uh, some difference in terms of giving them uh, the training that they need. So we're seeing the benefits even longer term, which hopefully someday many of you will be involved in these networks, <coughs> not just in doing studies, but maybe as, as participants. So what I'm gonna talk about is, is Neuronex, um, which, um, is, is kind of the, the positive and the challenging aspect of Neuronex is it probably applies to more of you uh, than some of the other networks because Neuronex is not a disease specific network. It really covers, you know, with the exception of the things covered by the other networks, everything that falls under the NINDS umbrella. So we have a broad range of diseases that we work on in the network. There's, there's a website so you can get more information if you're interested. It's a pretty easy uh, website to go www.neuronex.org. Um, so you can get all the info you want to know. We're very creative. Uh, to the website. Uh, we've been funded since 2011. It just got renewed for another five years, so we're really um, excited about that. There is the Data Coordinating Center at Iowa, uh, which um, which I uh, work at, Eric and, and Dixie and several others um, who are here. Uh, the Clinical Coordinating Center is at Mass General led by Amir Sikovic, who could not be here, but Mary Ann Chase uh, is in the back who works there. So we were very closely together. We have 25 funded clinical sites. Uh, we're actually in kind of the transition phase because there were eight sites that were replaced with new sites in the, in the um, uh, renewal of the networks. We're in the process of bringing on the new sites and working with the existing sites are still involved in, in studies. Uh, that um, We have uh, <coughs> worked on a number of different projects. When Neuronex was founded, it was, uh, was funded originally, there were kind of three major objectives, testing promising new therapies, again, across a range of different disease areas, uh, increasing the efficiency of clinical trials, so getting them uh, up and running and recruited uh, to get to the result uh, more efficient in the response quickly. And really a big focus of what the network uh, was put in place to do is focus on phase two clinical trials and biomarker studies. But in particular, to try to address some of the things that Eric alluded to in phase two trials, which is making sure they're rigorous. Um, there are a lot of things that are called phase two trials which really aren't answering the question. It kind of goes back to the point Rob made last night. If you're convinced your drug works, you just do a phase two trial where it can't fail and you get the answer and you go to phase three and then your phase three trial fails and you spent lots of time and resources and you wish you would have done something different at that point, uh, but it's kind of too late. So one of the things that we work really hard in terms of designing the studies is making sure there's some level of rigor with respect to go, no go criteria, that there's a question to answer, uh, and in some ways that there's a chance to fail. Um, for instance, we've had people come in and I don't, they tell us, I don't know what the, uh, what the endpoint to look at is. I want to look at these 10 endpoints, and if I see a positive effect on any one of them, I'm going to a phase three trial. Um, not even a statistically significant positive effect. Well, you're going to a phase three trial, right? I mean, there's almost no way that that study can't fail, whether the drug works or whether the drug doesn't work. So you really don't know much more uh, at the end of the day than you did uh, in many situations. Which is fine if it's your funding, uh, if it's taxpayer dollars, so you're going to NIH, you'd like to have some sense that if you're paying millions of dollars for a phase three trial, uh, that there's some good justification for that. Well, you can see here is the network that was funded in 2011. Uh, this is, uh, we're still in the transition mode. This is the uh, current uh, funding of the network. So uh, as I mentioned, there were eight new sites that have just come on board. In terms of the infrastructure, so you can see it's kind of the contact uh, information here. Uh, again, I mentioned myself and Merritt at the CCC, three kind of important people at NINDS that we work very closely with are Robin Conwit, uh, Janice Cordell, and Cogden uh, Lagoo. Uh, who uh, all handle kind of different aspects of the network within NIDS. We've had a number of proposals, so uh, I think close to 175 total proposals have come in to NINDS, not all of which then are passed forward uh, to, the, uh, to the network. If a proposal comes into the network, there's first a feasibility review. 
uh, in which it's assessed for feasibility. Are there patients at the sites in the network? Is there any specialized equipment or other challenges that would prevent the study being done? Uh, and if it passes that, then it goes for um, a grant submission uh, and it goes through grant review the way a grant uh, would in any other situation. So there's no, I think this is true of all of the networks, there's no funding within the network infrastructure to actually support clinical trials in and of themselves. The studies have to get their own funding uh, based on their own scientific merit and come into the networks. And you can see here the number of, of things that have passed through that have been approved by NEC. Uh, we had 25 initial grants funded through the first seven years, nine of which uh, were funded. A number fell out for various reasons. Uh, some of them um, didn't get through ESC, so it has to also go through an NINDS Extramural Science Council. Uh, which is for anything that's over 500 uh, direct uh, per year. Some things don't get through there. Others are withdrawn, which we found some people come in, there's a proposal, they come into the network, it's deemed feasible, and then they realize they have to write the grant, and they kind of thought the network would do all of that for them, and then they're not really that keen on doing that, which is probably a, a good uh, surrogate marker that they're probably not ready to lead a multi site clinical trial. Uh, and so the things that come through, what we found is, uh, if something gets a reasonable score on the first round, if we can respond to the critique, we've had pretty good success on second submissions of getting things funded. In terms of what the studies are, as I mentioned, this covers a broad range of diseases. So I've put the kind of a blurb of each of the nine funded studies here, and you can see the different diseases. These are all over the board, uh, from glioblastoma, the spinal muscular atrophy to fragile X, the Huntington's disease. So we're kind of in the, in the full space of what uh, the neurological world uh, looks like under NIMDS. Uh, in terms of what the network has done in the seven years, so if you break out kind of the key things, uh, we've been able to uh, test new interventions. We've done it, uh, and also there were three different mechanisms within Neuronex. There's the standard U01 academic PI, of which the majority of our proposals have come through. There was also an X01, which is uh, which has not been continued in the uh, second iteration, but that was an industry partnership where, in essence, NIH and uh, industry partner, there's a CRADA or like a contract between them and they share the cost. And there's also a small business mechanism. And so we've had trials in all three of them. We've been able to get studies up and running. We've been able to recruit um, more quickly, I think, given the network infrastructure and also the strengths of the clinical sites which were chosen based on their success uh, in leading clinical trials and in recruiting well uh, and, and good follow-up in clinical trials. Uh, just to give kind of uh, some quick highlights of things that have recently finished. So we're kind of at a nice point for Neuronex where studies are finishing for the first time and give some highlights of some recent results that have come out. Uh, our first uh, completed study manuscript came out just last December in the uh, Annals of Neurology, which was from the uh, spinal muscular atrophy biomarker study, which the network uh, had started uh, in, during kind of the first year, which was a, a two-year follow-up of babies uh, uh, diagnosed with SMA in the first six months of life. Um, I'll tell you, it's probably the most depressing study I've ever worked on because half the kids didn't live during the two-year period. But um, one of the things that is, uh, you see the positive result on the back end is, so we showed the difference in how the uh, you know, muscle progression, uh, survival, a lot of biomarker data on those kids, which, and they, as they say, timing is everything. So even though this wasn't an intervention study, this biomarker study was wrapping up about the time that some of the, the key intervention trials in SMA were finishing. And so as those studies were applied uh, to FDA for approval, the data from this uh, biomarker study done through Neuronext was shared and was part of that, uh, you know, the decision allocating, which gave a way to basically calibrate the control data seen in some of those studies because you're limited in terms of sample size to help strengthen uh, that data and play kind of an indirect role uh, in the regulatory decision in which the first uh, drug for uh, SMA was approved uh, about a year ago, I believe. And it was also then kind of nice for the network and a company editorial which kind of played that up and really said a lot of nice things about the Neuronex. And so a, uh, the Neuronex network. So in a lot of ways, even though we've been around for seven years, in terms of uh, being on the radar of people. Uh, there are a lot of people who are kind of seeing Neuronex for the first time because results of trials are coming out. And it's one thing to say, hey, we've got this great network, uh, apply it, come to us, we can do all these great things. It's another when you've actually taken things full force and you can show uh, results and you can point to successes. So in terms of for you guys, um, which may not necessarily uh, fit where you're at right now, if you may be planning a single site uh, proposal, which would not fit uh, in Neuronex, there is a 
uh, requirement you have to use a minimum of four sites uh, to be feasible for the network. But as you move into multi-center space, in terms of why using neural nets, I think it's a great way to access the infrastructure. So you have these sites, you have this expertise both from the design standpoint. A lot of what you get is similar to what you get in the course. Uh, when something comes in, as the grant is being developed, we assign a CCC lead and a DCC lead, which are very similar to your clinical and statistical leads that you have in your small group. Uh, and then there are other initiatives of the network. Uh, CIRB was a big one when we started in 2011, which is not as novel now, but in a lot of ways, Neuronex was one of the um, one of the first major networks to use central IRB. Uh, and it's been very successful for us. Also, the master clinical trial agreement, so all of the sites have contracts uh, with the network that covers all studies that are done in the network, which doesn't sound like a big deal, uh, but if you've ever had to negotiate contracts for a clinical trial and you realize once you get lawyers talking to lawyers how long that process can take out, that can shape six months to a year off of the start of time alone. I mentioned the design staff, but also each site has a 100% funded network coordinator, which is someone at the site to kind of coordinate and make sure that all of the activities done at that site are, are you know, running as smoothly as possible. So because we have different disease areas and the different sites that are funded are structured very differently, it's different personnel across the site that might be involved in different studies. And a lot of issues that you might have in a particular study might vary a lot even within a site because you might have a really strong Huntington's team that's done trials for a long time and the SMA site might be a different set of individuals, there's different issues, there might be turnover in one area, not in the other. The idea is that the network coordinator can try to standardize that as much as possible. Just to note, and a lot of this is on the website, but uh, if anyone is interested in submitting a proposal, you know, either soon or in the future, or anybody at your institutions are, you don't have to be at a network site to submit a proposal. Anyone can submit a proposal to the network. Uh, the first kind of uh, contact person would be Kadran Lugu at NIMDS and his contact information is, is here. The last thing I wanted to mention just to kind of uh, throw some things which are kind of relevant to a lot of the discussions in the small groups is when we look back at the summary statements from Neuronex and tried to look at kind of thematically what are the major criticisms that came out of projects that weren't funded. There are kind of four things that stand out which are similar at least in my small group things that we've discussed and probably in many of yours as well which is what's the scientific rationale and significance right is it really strong and there's actually in recent years been a more uh, increased emphasis on that whether there's good preliminary data to support doing this not just hey i used this in clinic and got a good result let's do a clinical trial um, which 10 20 years ago could have been valid justification for doing that uh, the dosing, the PK, so one of the biggest things, and, and the question was raised earlier about phase three and going back to phase two, is do you have the right dose? There's often such a rush to get to phase three that you may not have as much information where you know you're at the right dose uh, when you do the phase three study, or even when you're looking at phase two, are you looking at the full dose range to try to get a sense of do you know, A, how the drug is distributed in the body, how it's metabolized, and are you in the right uh, range of, of dose? Trial design which Eric alluded to, which is often you know, making sure it's a, it's a phase two trial that can address a question. And then the outcome measures. There's many times where we don't know the outcome measures. And one of the things that I, that I personally, not everyone agrees with this, but trying to develop and validate a biomarker in a phase two clinical trial I think is incredibly problematic because there's so many things uh, that confound that. And one of the challenges with phase two trials is we need better biomarkers. Uh, and so one of the areas, and, and there is a component of Neuronex that does biomarker studies, but having separate funding and doing studies to develop and validate biomarkers, which is really a problem in and of itself, you could have a whole full day course just on, on biomarkers, is needed in a lot of areas because one of the rate limiting steps to doing better phase two studies is the lack of better biomarkers in a lot of different disease areas. So that is that is Neuronex. I will turn it over. Siren. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and talk a little bit about the Siren Network. Um, Siren is a new network that was just funded last year, and it's really an evolutionary process of what originally started with the NINDS clinical trials um, group was the Neurologic Emergency Treatment Trials Network, which was meant to do studies looking at emergency care in neurological disorders really cover the whole spectrum in terms of stroke, spinal cord injury, uh, epilepsy, spinal cord injury, uh, traumatic brain injury, etc. That was funded in 2006. There are still some ongoing trials within that. 
Uh, at about the same time, there was a clinical trials network funded by the NHLDI, the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which was called the ROC, the Resuscitation Outcome Consortium. They were trying to decide whether or not they were going to continue their network. You know, in the interim, the stroke net network got stu uh, started in NINDS, and there were talks between NINDS and NHLBI about rather than each of them having their own emergency care trials network, maybe they should combine and have one emergency care trials network that really covered both spectra for the uh, institutes. And thus, in uh, 2017, uh, the SIREN network was started. So SIREN is jointly funded by uh, NINGS, by NHLBI, and a small amount of funding from, the, uh, from NCATS, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences as well. So the specific aims of um, the SIREN network are similar to the NET, uh, as opposed to Neuronex, which does primarily phase two trials. The NET was designed to do pr primarily confirmatory phase trials. And although there's we sort of snuck in a few late phase two trials into that. Uh, SIREN is very similar. So our job, our specific aims were to uh, recruit, efficiently perform, and disseminate clinically important trials in emergency patient care, create a culture of clinical trials that is collaborative and multidisciplinary, and transform the clinical research enterprise. And this is through using innovative designs, uh, engaging a lot of different patient stakeholders, and better operational strategies. So our design principles for SIREN are very similar to what they were in the net. Um, uh, one, we focus on early treatment. That doesn't necessarily limit itself to just pre-hospital care or just emergency department care. In fact, the, the two studies that we've got funded right now, I mentioned, uh, while they're emergency care, they're primarily ICU trials. Uh, NET and SIREN focus on meaningful outcomes for patients, so we don't do studies that don't have patient-oriented outcomes. So no financial studies to say this is more cost-effective than this. All the trials have to have meaningful outcomes for patients and have a patient-centered outcome for the primary outcome. We try to be as efficient as we possibly can. We try to be collaborative. Uh, I think we did a good job of doing that in the NET. Uh, one of the best experiences I ever had and sort of what I think led Rob and I and other people in the net to think we were actually being successful is when we were conducting the PROTECT study, which is a traumatic brain injury study, we were at an investigators meeting and the site PIs for this study were all over the place. Some were emergency physicians, some were trauma surgeons, some were neurosurgeons, some were neurocritical care people, uh, and there was a really wide spectrum. And I remember being there one time and, and one of the people there in the audience was saying, this is one of the coolest meetings I've ever been to because when people are getting up there and talking, I don't even know what specialty they are. I don't know if they're neurosurgeons, I don't know if they're emergency physicians, I don't know if they're neurologists. And it was, to me, sort of the epitome of what we wanted to achieve with collaboration. And then the other focus is on transforming the clinical trials enterprise. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in terms of uh, study design later. Like Neuronext, we have a, uh, a CCC, a DCC, and we have sites. Uh, and we have multiple PI leadership plan uh, in, in the CCC and DCC for the C Clinical Coordinating Center, which is based here at the University of Michigan. Uh, myself, Robert Silverblight, and Cliff Calloway from the University of Pittsburgh are uh, multiple PIs for the SIREN Clinical Coordinating Center. The Data Coordinating Center for SIREN is at the Medical University of South Carolina, and the PIs for that are Yuko Palish and Valerie Durkowski, who's here. And then we have a host of federal partners uh, in the NIH. Uh, Jeremy Brown is the Scientific Program Director for the uh, project from NINDS. Carolina Mendoza Puccini is the Administrative Program Director. Uh, we have uh, George Sopko and Emily Tinsley from the Heart Institute. Uh, Robin Conwood also from NINDS. And Lupe Aquino who's from the uh, MCATS group. The map looks like this. Um, as opposed to Neuronext, which has 25 sites, our net, we finished up with about 22 uh, hub sites. SIREN has been scaled back, so there are a limited number of clinical sites in uh, SIREN, and, or I should say hub sites. And those are 11, and you can see the list of those sites here. Uh, the coordinating center, as I mentioned, the clinical coordinating center is here in Michigan, and the data center is at Medical University of South Carolina. 
Like the net, uh, we operate on a hub and spoke mechanism because 11 clinical sites are not enough to carry out the trials that we want to do. So a lot of these sites have multiple either hubs affiliated with the award hubs or a lot of times spokes, and that's a little more complicated than I can explain in this talk. But suffice it to say that it is a scalable network. Um, one of the trials that we've got that's just kicking off right now is probably going to have about 50 sites uh, in it. The other clinical trial that's going right now has 15. The scope of the portfolio, as I mentioned earlier, is late learning phase or late phase two or confirmatory phase trials. As I mentioned earlier, we are looking for patient-oriented outcomes as a primary outcome for all SIREN studies. And as opposed to the net, I, we're open to looking at different um, mechanisms. And I think Rob mentioned in his keynote address last night that you know there's no one right trial, there's no one design to do every single trial. And some studies may require different designs. Some may require a you know controlled efficacy trial similar to what we're used to doing. We're also very interested in looking at registry-based uh, randomized clinical trials. We, when we were putting the SIRE network together, we have some affiliations and uh, articles of agreement with the American Heart Association with their Get With the Guidelines program also with the American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, with their National Trauma Data Bank, that if we were interested in partnering with randomized clinical trials onto these registry-based uh, databases that are being gathered, we've got some, at least a way to go forward with, with looking at that. We've not done any of those right now, but we've discussed some of those. And obviously the trial has to be an appropriate size for our scalable network. Although the Ultimately, the vision for SIREN in terms of the types of trials that might be done are not necessarily limited to neurological or heart, lung, and blood, but in this early phase, particularly in the first five years, uh, because our two primary funders are NINDS and NHLBI, uh, our primary focus will be on neurological, cardiac, lung, and blood emergencies. Um, in terms of neurological emergencies, stroke studies are out of SIREN, obviously. The stroke studies are being done in StrokeNet, but any neurological emergency that is not stroke potentially is, uh, is good for the SIREN network. Again, we may have secondary focus on other IC portfolios and health services trials, but right now this is the way we're starting. So, how do studies get into SIREN and you know, what's the evolution of those? It's very similar to the way we operated the net. And one is that you know, obviously the key thing is having scientifically and clinically important questions and observations. And those can come from anybody. One does not have to be a member or a site in SIREN to do a study in SIREN. Uh, that was the same in the net. And in fact, most of the PIs for the studies that we had in the net were actually not originally part of the net. They were from outside the net. But those trial ideas can come from anybody. And we encourage people with ideas to either start their discussions uh, in several different ways. One is they could start those with program directors at either of the institutes, either the Heart, Lung, and Blood or Neurological Institute. Or they could start the discussions with uh, the DCC and the CCC and pitch trial ideas to us about ideas that might be good. Eventually, we link up those two groups uh, together so ultimately, it's going to be NIH personnel and CCC and DCC personnel who are all in the loop as we're developing these trials. But um, we would work together, but it might start at either end. It might come through NIH program uh, directors or it might come directly to the CIRA network. We would then, uh, at, at some point when we decide this is something of interest to the network, we would begin discussions with those um, with those people interested in these trials, and we would evaluate the fit of the trial for the network, uh, contribute to the site con to the concept, and also relate to the site PIs. We do not act as a peer review group for clinical trial ideas, and uh, we try to figure out ways to collaborate with people to make better trials, but not to say, you know, do a study section, the equivalent of a study section review and say, sorry, take this somewhere else. So what we would do is, and we usually do this in a collaborative way, most of the trials that went through the net and uh, so far the trials that have gone through SIREN usually have someone from the SIREN network that'll be one of multiple PIs on the trial project. And so there's sort of a lead person from the network usually in the trial leadership. 
we would develop a clinical trial summary and a rough budget, all of our studies in net, and so far all of our studies on SIREN exceed that $500,000 a year mark, and so we need pre-approval from ESC to be able to submit a grant, uh, and then we would work with the investigators to submit a grant, hopefully get that funded, and hopefully get that study going. So again, potential sources could be early referrals from program officers, it can be investigators contacting us directly, we can also look at developing our own clinical trials. So um, things that, you know, if we're looking at areas in our portfolio that we think are underrepresented, and for example, one of those in the net and, and also in SIREN would be spinal cord injury. There are no big phase, you know, confirmatory phase spinal cord injury trials that either NET or SIREN would be involved in. So this is certainly a need. Uh, but we would look at things that might address needs uh, for the network, uh, address portfolio gaps or IC priorities. We might get these ideas from retreats and workshops and we do have a cyber retreat. Uh, or we're also interested in working with industry partners uh, as well. So what are we doing up to this point in time? So the Siren Network was just funded uh, last year. So we've been up just barely over a year. Um, we have two current studies that are funded both by NINDS and both work on both of these studies actually started before we even knew there was going to be a SIREN network um, and that was I think I'm glad we did that now because it, it gave us two trials to start off with when we got going but those are the and I'll talk about these a little bit further the hyperbaric oxygen brain injury trial or HOBIT and the brain oxygen op optimization severe TBI phase 3 the boost 3 trial those are both uh, funded the Boost 3 study just recently funded within the last month. And we've got a couple studies in the pipeline as well. So the Hobit study, hyperbaric oxygen brain injury trial, the, the uh, contact PI is Galen Roxwald, who's a neurosurgeon from Minnesota. This has been an area that he's been very interested in for a long time, uh, is the effects of hyperbaric oxygen in traumatic brain, severe traumatic brain injury. He's conducted several clinical trials in this area and has wanted to get, uh, always desired to get a phase three clinical trial in this area. We worked uh, with Galen uh, and Byron Gajewski and Renee Martin, uh, two statisticians, to look at a very, a very unique adaptive design of uh, the late phase two clinical trial. One of the questions with hyperic oxygen is there are a lot of different ways to deliver it. There are, you can deliver it at different atmospheric pressures, 1.52 or 2.5. You can also, some regimens would, would suggest that maybe giving intercurrent normal baric oxygen might be helpful. Uh, so we're looking at actually seven different treatment regimens for hyperbaric oxygen with a concurrent control group. Uh, and it's uh, set up to have five or 200 patients. The interesting primary outcome on this study is not a p-value. The interesting primary outcome on this study is that if there is greater than a 50% probability of success in a phase three trial, the study is a success and we move forward. The secondary outcome is that in addition to saying that we think there's a greater than 50% probability of success in a phase three trial, this phase two trial, this adaptive design, will identify the most likely dose to carry through in a phase three trial. So this is really one of these things where we hope, hopefully we're not missing the boat. So if the study is negative, it'll fail hopefully very efficiently and we can say you don't have to look at hyperbaric oxygen anymore because we've sort of covered bases. But um, anyway, we're just getting to work on that right now. The, uh, I'm sorry, wrap up. First two patients have been entered in that trial right now and we are actively enrolling. Boost 3, uh, which is looking as a phase 3 trial to determine whether management strategies based on brain tissue oxygen monitoring and ICP monitoring improves outcome from severe TBI compared to management based on ICP alone. That study is going to enroll over 1,000 patients. Um, primary outcome you can see is a sliding dichotomy GLC at six months, and we just received the funding for that. We've got two other studies that are under review. One is ICECAP which is looking at the optimal duration of cooling for in uh, hypothermia after cardiac arrest. That grant was got submitted and got reviewed this year and uh, resubmission is in process at this time. And then the last study that's in the pipeline is chest pain. This is looking at comparative health effectiveness strategies, testing chest pain assessment uh, in the emergency department. It's a non-inferiority trial uh, scheduled to enroll 16,000 patients. 
That grant was submitted and reviewed as well, and we're planning a resubmission on that uh, too. So that is all I have. I'll answer questions later. Hi, uh, Pooja Khatri. I just want to comment that I actually was in this course myself about a decade ago. So, um, and I just published the study that I was working on developing in this course. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, and uh, and I remember sitting there and thinking about how many moving parts I had, how much I still had to figure out, and so that's normal. So I just wanted to say that that's part of that whole iterative process. That's what makes you design a really good child. So um, I'm going to tell you just real briefly about StrokeNet. My presentation will be fairly brief because you'll see a lot of recurring themes from the previous two publications or presentations. These are my disclosures. <laughs> Um, so just to give you a big picture context that of what you've heard so far, so you've heard about how Bill Barson started the NET about a decade ago. That was really the first clinical trial network within NINDS where they were doing the phase three trials in emergency medicine. And, and that no longer exists. It was very successful. Um, and then that led to Neuronext being developed. And Neuronext, as you've heard about from Chris Coffey, is pilot trials in the neurosciences. And now I'm going to talk to you about StrokeNet, which uh, came aboard about five years ago now, and that's all phases of stroke, acute prevention and recovery, and we also theoretically do biomarker studies that immediately feed into a trial. So we haven't actually had one of those yet, but that's, there's actually one under review right now. And then we have Siren that you just heard about with, from Bill, which is sort of the newest kid on the block. And so just like all the networks that you've heard about, there's always a national coordinating center. Ours is at University of Cincinnati with me and Joe Broderick um, leading it. And then there's the National Data Management Center, and that's, again, Medical University of South Carolina, led by Hugo and Wen Lee. And then we have regional coordinating centers, 27 of them now. We just had a five-year renewal, so we just got these funding awards in the last month, so we're pleased about that. Um, and they're affiliated with over 300 hospitals, so it's a pretty huge network. Um, and uh, there's a map right now of our, our kind of updated network. So you can see we cover a lot of the country. The goal is really to be geographically dispersed so we get very generalizable trials. Um, key elements of these regional coordinating centers are that there's a like, for example, I have one at Cincinnati, a regional coordinating center, so I have funding for a program manager, funding towards a trainee. Um, and then um, what some people have alluded to already, we have to participate in a master trial agreement. That was what Bill Barson and the NET sort of spearheaded, this idea that we don't have to do a whole new set of major contracts every time we start a trial, and that lets us start up trials faster. And then the central IRB, which was spearheaded by Neuronex, showing that we could then not, we could have one IRB vet the trial, and then when we have amendments, you're not going through every single site, which you've probably seen in other trials. It's a lot of work if you're in a multi-center trial doing that. So all of that is, you know, to create efficiency. And then something kind of unique to StrokeNet is we have working groups, um, and they have representation from all of our sites. Um, there's the acute working book group that I chair with Jeff Sager. There's the prevention group, which is Mark Chimowitz and Ralph Sacco, and then the recovery working group, which is Steve Kramer and Stephen Wolf. And I know you can't read all those names, but my slides will be posted. And some of these people are probably at your institutions, and I think they're great resources for kind of helping you get your foot in the door if you're thinking towards a stroke net trial in the future. We also have education core led by Don Kleindorfer and an imaging core led by Max Winnermark and several advisory committees that we pull in for trial specific issues. So a lot of great people involved. Um, so I'll spend just a couple minutes talking about how concepts go, go through our network. A little bit of overlap with all of the other things you've heard, but we've all got a little bit of a different flavor or approach. Um, so generally, StrokeNet for us is, uh, is a, a trial that's StrokeNet eligible if it's not stroke and five or more sites. So, um, and then the ideas can arise within or outside StrokeNet, and then the process is such that you bring your trial to us and we, we basically help you try to make it as strong as you can, do a feasibility assessment, and then submit it. So we're not peer review, just like I think Bill was saying. We're just, we're basically a bunch of trialists trying to help you create the strongest trial you can. So um, this is kind of a little flow chart to give you a sense. You've got this idea, 
you're generally formulating it, you might talk to somebody from the working group, one of the chairs, me or Joe, um, and then, or you might talk to an NIDS program officer, but then what gets your foot in the door is we have a concept proposal form that you fill out, and that formally engages you with um, NIH DrugNet, and then that form gets shuffled over to one of the working group chairs, and say it comes to me, then what we do is I chat with you a little more, and we schedule you for a working group uh, call, and we talk through your proposal in great detail and, and give advice, and you get to see some reactions to your idea and see how people, um, what people think will and will not work. Um, and then ultimately you get our recommendations, and then you do with that what you'd like, and then you go to uh, ESC for approval. And I think that was mentioned before, but the bottom line is that NINDS has only a certain amount of money, so they have to set their programmatic priorities, and that's why they have to approve in advance these large trials, because if you get a great score, they want to make sure that they've prioritized it and it fits their priorities. So if you get that ESC approval permission, that means you have a permission to apply for an NIH grant. Then you'll do a formal feasibility assessment with us where we'll survey the sites and make sure we've figured out how many sites you need to actually get your trial done based on the numbers that they have. And then you'll submit your grant, you will peer, get peer reviewed and hopefully get a good score. And then you will go to council and you will hopefully get approved for funding and then develop the final protocol as a team with us and move forward. So that's the general idea. I want to just very briefly mention that we have an educational core, and um, basically it's the core supervises the StrokeNet fellowships, and we also do formal feedback on research projects, if any of you are at StrokeNet sites. And then also we uh, have a bunch of webinars, and some of them overlap with the content in this course, and I think that's great because it gives you other perspectives on some of the same issues. So we've got StrokeNet Grand Rounds, which is more like topical about stroke-related uh, disease issues, and then we have professional de de development webinars, so like another how to prepare a clinical budget, how to present your data, how to consult with a statistician, and these are all publicly available, so if you want another perspective on these issues, that's a great resource. Um, it's run really well by Dawn uh, Klein Dorfer. So, um, and then I wanted to tell you just briefly about our StrokeNet trials uh, and where we are. There's some fun history in that. So CREST-2 uh, was, was a, is a stenting trial for asymptomatic crowded stenosis. It's about halfway done. It actually was kind of conceived and, and funded before StrokeNet became official and then sort of got rolled into StrokeNet. So we don't actually do the clinical coordination for that trial. And then there's the MISTI trial, which is just finished and is in the follow-up phase, which is looking at minimally invasive surgery and all to place for intracranial hem intracerebral hemorrhage by Dan Hanley, again, sort of developed before StrokeNet officially got going. And then we get to some of the first uh, trials that are actually been a part of StrokeNet. Um, one is IDEF, Deproxamine for iron chelation, an iron chelation agent for ICH outcomes and recovery by Magdi Saleem, and that just finished up. Um, Tele-Rehabs, uh, you might have heard about that. It's, uh, I think it's just being published and it hasn't been released. That was probably the very first trial that we did that was truly like we participated in the in, in the in the in the, in the uh, initiation and development all the way through. Um, and tele rehab showed us that home tele rehab is not inferior to going to the clinic for uh, rehabilitation after stroke. So um, I thought that was a really cool study um, that was just presented at the European Stroke Conference in May. And then the Diffuse 3 trial, um, which has been a real game changer in our field, changing acute stroke therapy to 24 hours. That was led by Greg Elbers. That was completely homegrown. It went through a whole like working group process and everything. So we're really proud of that, and, and that's been published. Um, we are proud to say that we've been ahead of recruitment schedules, which is actually something I think probably all the networks can say, and I think that's a large reason why networks exist, because we found there's so much efficiency in working together like this. Um, we've got an ancillary study to CREST that's enrolling right now, looking at cognitive outcomes in those asymptomatic carotid stenoses. Um, Arcadia is actually by Human Kamel and colleagues, and Human was a member of this course, what, like three, four years ago? So, and we're really proud to have him on board. He's one of the new trialists on 
on board, and he has been moving along um, with getting his trial going. He's got about 10% in. This was one of our, that's been our, like our biggest jump in trial sites because they have 120 sites, so we're really proud as a national coordinating center that we've got about 110 of them up finally. So um, it's been a good learning curve for us to, to, to do that large scale work. And then now, and we're really excited and a little daunted, we got a huge bolus of, of trial approvals um, within the last six months. So um, the most trial was actually maybe about six months, yeah, or nine months ago. Um, that one is just getting ready to enroll. That's using antithrombotics with Altaplace, led by Okwe Adeowe, also a relatively new trialist, Andrew Barreto, and then some senior trialists, Jim Broder and Jim Broder Joe Broderick. Sleep Smart, which actually Devin Brown was in the clinical trial methods course as well, and this was the trial that she was developing in this course, um, and so she got that funded, um, and that's looking at early APAP treatment of um, obstructive sleep apnea for sh prevention and stroke recovery. Transport 2, transcranial direct uh, current stimulation for motor recovery in the setting of constraint-induced um, motor therapy. So it's a dose-finding phase 2 study um, by Godfrey Shog and Ling Fen. And then we've got Saturn by Magdi Salim. He's our first next co person coming twice back to StrokeNet, and he's looking at statin discontinuation after intracerebral hemorrhage. I acquire, we're finally going to hit the pediatric realm. That's looking at intensive rehab for infants with strokes, um, specifically using constraint induced therapy. And then finally, we just learned last week that um, I should say I acquire isn't officially funded, but it's looking really good for funding. Um, we're really optimistic, and then Aspire as well. And Aspire is Kevin Shep and Human Kamel again. So it's fun to see uh, people really kind of building our, the portfolio and helping us answer some quick questions. And they're looking at a question that we always struggle with clinically when you have a patient who has atrial fibrillation and needs some uh, anticoagulation for stroke prevention, but now they have an ICH, and should we still be continuing that on anticoagulation? So I'll end by just saying a, a, few, a couple quick thoughts for you all as you're considering um, your trials. If you're considering being a multi-center trialist, which most of you are eventually gonna do if you're not doing yet, I'd encourage you if you're in the stroke field and you're at a stroke net site to, to join uh, the stroke committee webinars, steering committee webinars, because they're just a nice way to help you get a feel for what we're doing and how we're doing it. And then, um, and then watch the educational webinars, no matter what field you're in. I think there, some of them are really useful, the professional development. Um, and then, I, you know, um, sometimes you find that your child is turning into a phase three child early in your career. Um, and that can be quite challenging. And so my advice to you is that, that that shouldn't stop you, but that's where you need to like beef up your multiple PIs with some senior clinical trialists who have completed multi-center trials so that you've got that strong support because it is really a skill in itself to do these large-scale multi-center trials. Um, and then finally, I just want everyone to know that you want to get in touch with StrokeNet at least six months in advance of the deadline that you've had to do at the NIH because there's all that work that I just talked about that we all do together. So um, I will end with a dog picture. And some of you know I was like talking this up like crazy last summer because I was coming to pick up that little eight-week-old Limeriner on my way home from the clinical trial methods course. And, and you can't see his cute, beautiful blue eyes that he had, but um, he's been a blast. His name is Milo. And then that's me FaceTiming with my dog. So, <laughs> don't tell anybody. <laughs>